Chapter 9, Redeeming the Past. God will redeem our past if we let him. He will redeem it by using even our worst choices and experiences to accomplish something good. I have seen students who perform poorly in school out of pure laziness become excellent teachers because their own failure as students showed them why students struggle and how they best learn. I have seen abused children become effective social workers because they understand how abuse starts and how it can be reversed. I have performed the weddings of young brides and grooms who have purpose to remain true to their vows, thus changing a direction set by their parents who, for whatever reason, could not make their marriages work. Failures can give us clues to our calling. Charles Colson, hatchet man for President Nixon, was convicted of crimes associated with Watergate and spent seven months in prison. He turned his life over to Jesus Christ just before his incarceration. But his experience in prison did not leave him bitter or full of regret. Instead, it opened his eyes to the needs of prison inmates. He eventually started Prison Fellowship, a successful ministry to inmates and their families. Pope John Paul II grew up in Poland and witnessed firsthand the cruelties of communism. He has become one of the most zealous advocates of human rights in the world today. When still a teenager, Joni Eriksson Tata suffered a tragic accident left her a quadriplegic. Her books, paintings, testimony, and ministry of hope now inspire millions of disabled people. It is easy to dismiss Chuck Colson, John Paul, Pope John Paul II, and Joni Erickson Tata as too extraordinary, but I have observed the redemptive power of God at work in ordinary people too. One woman I know excels at encouraging others even though she lost her husband recently in an automobile accident. I have correspond with a teacher who invests time and energy in troubled youth in spite of the fact that his father was brutally murdered by just such a young person. I work with a colleague who cares for more people on campus than anyone though he came from a loveless family. I have seen these people in action and have benefited from their goodness. Each one of them is marked by something from the past they cannot change. It is not in spite of, but because of, past difficulties that they have become so kind and influential. Experiencing Redemption God will redeem our past if we allow him, but he will require our cooperation. We must be willing to receive his forgiveness, to forgive others, and to wait for God to effect the redemption we long for. First, we must be willing to receive forgiveness. I used to think that if people had a problem with forgiveness, it was that they refused to admit their need for forgiveness. They were quick to accuse, but slow to admit fault. They blamed more easily than they accepted responsibility. Now I've come to realize many people have a different problem. They cannot accept God's forgiveness, and they cannot forgive themselves. They feel so much regret that they are constantly reviewing their foolish mistakes, playing the tape in their memory until their mistakes dominate their lives. They hate themselves for what they have done, and they cannot let the past go. The problem is not with God. God sent Jesus Christ to deal with the problem of sin once and for all. He promises to forgive and to redeem. But we must be willing to admit our failures, take responsibility for what we have done, and then accept forgiveness. We must be willing to let the past stand as it is, giving up all rights to change. To change it, deny it, or obsess about it. In short, we must surrender the past to God. It takes courage to accept forgiveness. Gordon MacDonald reached the pinnacle of success in evangelical Christianity when in the late 1980s he became the president of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Already a proven pastor and popular author, he stepped into that high-profile position with great expectations. But unknown to almost everyone, MacDonald had been having an affair. Shortly after assuming leadership at IVCF, the affair became public knowledge. MacDonald resigned in disgrace. Wisely, he sought help from friends who advised him to withdraw from the public eye and submit to discipline. A group of men guided him through a long period of repentance and rehabilitation until he was ready once again to provide leadership for the church. MacDonald admitted his guilt, accepted forgiveness, and forgave himself as well. Gratefully, a capable but fallible leader was not permanently lost to the church. Second, We must be willing to forgive. Bitterness can be just as ruinous to the soul as regret, if not more so. The one who suffers the most from bitterness is the one who is bitter. What infection does to the human body, bitterness does to the soul. It consumes and destroys. The antibiotic used to treat the disease of bitterness is forgiveness. Forgiveness never happens in a moment. Sometimes it takes a lifetime, yet it begins with a decision. We must want to forgive and then choose to forgive, even if we do not feel like forgiving. Forgiveness, as Lewis Meads argues in Forgive and Forget, 
does not whitewash wrongdoing or justify evil. It assumes that the wrong done is truly wrong and deserves judgment and punishment. But forgiveness manifests a willingness to give up to God the right to judge and punish an offender, to see that person as a real human being, and to begin to wish him or her well. Forgiveness does not always restore the relationship, which requires movement from both sides, but it lets the hurt go and moves on. Forgiveness assumes that God is in control, that he will do justice at the proper time, and that he will make all things right in due time. Thus, even when the relationship is not restored because the offender doesn't care or continues to offend or disappears or even dies, forgiveness works redemption into the heart of the person who does the forgiving. The act of forgiveness becomes a conduit for God's grace to work in that person. God's grace can work wonders, too, whether or not the offender takes responsibility for the wrongdoing. Grace can heal the soul, form character, create peace, and provide opportunities for ministry. It can transform a person so dramatically that he or she emits, as Paul testifies, a fragrance of life rather than an odor of death. It has only been in the last 10 years that the mental health community has conducted research on forgiveness and the results seem clear. Forgiveness mitigates depression and anxiety, increases self-esteem, and improves physical health and emotional well-being. It releases people from living in bondage and allows them to live in freedom. Forgiveness heals the soul. An article on forgiveness in the January 2000 edition of Christianity Today tells the story of Sidna Mace, who became embittered after Diane, a friend and neighbor, was murdered. She learned later that Diane's husband was an accomplice. Sidna was enraged. I had a dear, dead friend and now live behind three motherless kids, she said. I felt I had every right to hate the murderer who caused this. But over time, she began to notice that something was happening inside her own soul, something ugly and evil. The life sentence meted out to the murderer, Jennifer, did little to diminish her rage and hatred. There was no relief in her sentencing. That's the thing with hatred and bitterness. It eats you alive. Every time I passed the house, I missed Diane, and I became angry all over again. At first, Sidna recoiled from the idea of forgiving Jennifer, but the teachings of Scripture persuaded her to reconsider. So she decided to write a letter to Jennifer to tell her that she had forgiven her. She described the impact of writing that letter. A weight lifted. That's when I learned that anger, bitterness, and forgiveness keep you from experiencing the depths of joy. That letter was only the beginning. She began corresponding with Jennifer, and they have become friends. Forgiveness, of course, does not always come so quickly or so in so happily. Forgiveness is a process, not an instant. It is a decision of the will, not an emotion we feel. It sends us on a journey to which there is no obvious end. We may, we may have to forgive a person many times over for a single offense as the consequences of his or her wrongdoing continue to plague us. Finally, we must be willing to wait for God to work things out for our good. As the prophet Isaiah wrote, <coughs> speaking for the Lord God, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. Neither is God's timing run according to our own. His timing can run both slower than ours and faster than ours. Impatience cuts short the healing process. Real healing comes slowly and often painfully, as anyone who has had major surgery will testify. The long-term benefits can be wonderful, though the short-term experience usually makes one think otherwise. In the case of redemption, the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line. Our human eyes see what we think God will do or should do to re redeem the past. But our vision is severely limited. To accomplish his redemptive purposes, God might set in motion events that may follow a circ circuitous path to achieve the desired result. So we must wait, but that is not all we can do. We can also do the will of God in the present moment however unpleasant that moment is. The past is over and done, but God is alive and well. Once we turn to him, we are immediately in the center of his will, regardless of the circumstances. God will begin at that very moment to work redemption into our lives, writing a story that will end in triumph, that will end for our good. God will somehow bring the consequences of the past on us in the form of a blessing. His grace will lead to a life of no regrets and free us from bitterness but we must be willing to wait for him to accomplish it. Redemption in my own past. I have seen God's redemptive power at work in my own family, although it took many years and engendered great pain. My sister Diane and I, and I have lost both our parents. We lost our mother in the accident in 1991 and our father to cancer in 1999. 
We have spent many hours together reflecting on the past, searching as if we were detectives for clues to make sense of the past and find evidence of redemption. We have also sought to heal from a past that was not always happy or easy. My mother grew up in a small town and came from a good, conservative Dutch family. She attended church and Christian school, but in her 20s she rebelled against her background. She dated men she should have avoided and eventually married one of them, my own father. She continued to live in rebellion until several years later her oldest brother exhorted her to return to God and the church. She heeded his advice, repented, and began to live for God again. Though her return to faith was genuine, she paid dearly for the decisions she made during her rebellious years, including nearly 30 years of marital chaos. My dad, one of the most likable and brilliant people I have ever known, came from a troubled background, which plagued him like a stubborn parasite his whole life. He was enormously successful in business early on, but fatal flaws in his character sabotaged his success and sent him on a downward spiral of humiliation and failure. He drank too much, cavorted too often, and tried too hard to succeed. He made many bad decisions and hurt many people, especially himself. He divorced my mother after three decades of marriage, and he remarried only a few months after the divorce. That marriage ended in divorce too. He spent nearly 30 years enduring one crisis after another. Obviously, he was not the only one affected. I still remember the whiskey glass glued to his hand, the nights he never came home, the shady characters he knew, the arguments that only ended after he stormed out of the house. He rarely attended my tennis matches and swimming meets, though I didn't care much at the time because his very presence embarrassed me. He was absorbed by his own neediness, driven by his own insecurity. The story of my parents' lives could have ended badly, as badly as the plot foreshadowed. The relationship between my dad and me was strained for many years, though we never broke off communication. I wrote numerous letters to him. Much later, after his death, I reread some of the letters which he had saved. My honesty and criticism startled me. I did not communicate much grace to him early on. I lambasted him for divorcing my mother and condemned him for remarrying. I disliked my dad during those years and I saw little hope of redemption. But life doesn't always play out the way we expect. God's presence changes everything, ultimately for the good, although it takes time. My mother's journey of faith started much sooner than my dad's. She became a woman of unusual faith and strength. Somehow, she found the grace to rise above the pain of her marriage. She showed amazing restraint when my dad went into his tirades. She was kind and respectful without being a doormat. She never yelled or manipulated. She maintained poise and dignity in circumstances that would have pushed most people over the edge. She practiced hospitality too. I lived across the street from the high school. I went home for lunch almost every day and I usually took 10 to 15 friends with me. Even when I had meetings during lunch, my friends went to my house for lunch anyway because they liked visiting with my mother. She had unusual goodness in her, a goodness forged in suffering. After the divorce, my mother moved back to Linden, Washington, her hometown, and she went to work as director of nursing in a retirement home. She became active in a church and served the needy. She excelled at being a homemaker, community leader, and friend. She especially relished her role as a grandmother. She had a knack for giving special attention to the grandchild who was having the hardest time in life. My, my kids called her the outdoor grandma because she loved to play with them outside. She prayed faithfully for her grandchildren too, as she, as she said, she considered it part of her job description in life. When she died at age 75, hundreds of people flocked to her funeral and lauded her as a modern day Good Samaritan. My father's journey of redemption was harder. He endured years of financial hardship, which resulted in bankruptcy and led to the loss of a valuable piece of property on Lake Michigan that had been in the family for decades. He had to go to court more times than I can remember. He even spent time in jail. I felt shame that we shared the same last name, and I bristled whenever people said that I reminded them of my dad. When he hit bottom at the age of nearly 80, he had only one way to look. He turned to God, and he found Christian friends who treated him with genuine kindness. He read Christian books and attended church faithfully. By then, our relationship had been restored. We had both softened considerably. He had stopped trying to win my approval, and I had begun to care for him as the interesting, complex, broken man that he was. He became proud of me, largely because he saw me as the man he wanted to become, and I finally accepted the truth of who my dad was and not what I wanted him to be. We talked on the phone every week or two, and he sent me newspaper clippings of stories about religion that appeared in papers and magazines he was reading. He was honest about his failures and regrets, too. 
He once told me after watching me raise my kids during one of his visits, now I know what I missed. I was always too busy trying to make a buck. What a mistake I made. I think we had an unspoken agreement between us that I was somehow completing a story that he had, that he had begun. I was carrying on where he had left off. We never became as close as I am to my own sons, but we nevertheless shared a common bond and a sense of mutual appreciation. In the fall of 1998, he discovered he had cancer. Typical for my dad, he was confident he could beat it. But in January, he took a turn for the worse. The doctor summoned my sister, brother-in-law, and me to Michigan, where he had the rare privilege of spending three days with him, or we had the rare privilege of spending three days with him before he died. We shared faith with him, prayed with him, sang to him, and spent many wonderful moments with his family and friends. We experienced a new level of intimacy and peace with him during those final days together, and we were with him when he died. He told us he was ready to die, and he died believing. Two days before he died, I asked my dad what he wanted done at his funeral. He suggested a few hymns and biblical texts. Then he turned to me and said, You must do it, son. You're the only one who can do it right. I'll never forget that moment. His request was like a sign from God, who was assuring me that he was making all things good and right. I chose 2 Corinthians 5, 16-17 as the text. At his funeral service, I talked about what it means to view someone like my dad from a human point of view. What I saw in him was both glorious and deeply flawed. But that, that text does not end with a, point, with a human point of view. It ends with a divine point of view. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything has passed away. See, everything has become new. My parents' journey was hard. There are many painful moments along the way for all of us. Even now, I feel a great deal of ambivalence. Grateful for the way their lives ended, yet saddened by the wasted years. My dad never really functioned as a father for me, at least not as I define normal fatherhood. I'm glad he died believing, though I wish he had done better in the living. This longing will never go away. But the story did not end ignominiously or tragically, though it seemed for many years that it would. I did not always believe that God would or even could redeem what appeared on the surface of things to be ugly, sordid, and evil. However real, the process of redemption can be harsh and gritty, like stripping old paint off furniture before it can be refinished. But in the end, I witnessed God's power at work. God was telling a story that turned out to be beautiful and holy. The pain was part of the story, but there was more to the story than the pain. In the end, our past was redeemed. My story is only one. It is an example, imperfect and incomplete, of how God works redemptively. I know sons whose relationship with their fathers have made more progress than mine did. I also know other sons whose fathers died before there was even a hint of restoration. I have observed some marriages make it against all odds, and others fail, though I thought there was still hope. The course that redemption takes varies from person to person. It does not always unfold quickly. It does not always fix everything that was broken. It does not always happen even within one's lifetime. But that, is, but that it does happen and will happen is sure because God is real and God is true. However long, difficult, and complex, redemption will occur because God has pledged himself to it. Jesus Christ is incontrovertible evidence of just how serious God is.